Ah. So my name is Leo Johnson Sabine, thank you for that. I do stuff around the future. I used to be um, at the World Bank doing environmental and resource economics, and then I set up my own company, and we do, and we do all sorts of stuff around the future, and I do a Radio 4 program called Future Proofing. I don't know if anyone is from England or listens ever to Radio 4, but it's on at 8.15 on Wednesdays normally, which is, of course, the same time as Bake Off, okay? <laughs> so, which is, you know, so no one actually listens to this program, but, but even my mother. Um, but look, what, what I'd love to do is just, um, I don't know. Okay, one of the series we've got coming up is on this very uplifting topic, the apocalypse, okay? We're going to explore, you know, how is that? How is that coming, the apocalypse? Any signs of progress on the arrival of the apocalypse? You look at the news today with the latest hurricane battering North Carolina, with the shades of protectionism and the spirits of the 30s, the ghosts of the worst of the last century. Are we headed to the apocalypse, or are we headed to wonderful life? What's it going to be like? What's it going to be like? What's it going to be like for us? What's it going to be like for our kids? And what's the role of this sector in any of that? So that's what I'd love to just throw out some ideas from. And this is not very intellectual. There's very little data. From an academic perspective, it's very unrobust, OK? This presentation is very unrobust, this speech. But I just want to throw out one picture and also maybe a few stories, a few quick stories. OK, so if we look to the future, there's the great um, science fiction writer, William Gibson, who says the future's already here. It's just not yet evenly distributed. I want to show you one picture, which I think gives some glimpses of different types of future that could be arriving. And I think the tussle between them is what I really want to discuss a little bit. Anyone guess where this is? Which continent? Africa. It's Africa. It's just outside Nairobi. Um, it's you know, about 45 minutes from the Westgate Center where there was the bombing by Al-Shabaab a while back. Um, and I visited this site, and what struck me about this is you've got two possible futures that both have crash-landed onto the same spot here. You see in the picture on the fence, ICT Technopolis. Here is one possible future. And it's not just in Nairobi where there's now four of them ringing um, ringing the city, um, but it's global. It's all over Africa, it's all over China. And I think even within the 90 nations here, what we're starting to see is the polarization of communities and of technological models underpinning those communities and the way they live their lives. And I just want to talk through what these cities, which are also both visions of what people are meant to be like, do to us. So if we take the city on the big poster, call it the city of exponential tech, the movement from the city of Henry Ford that we've all lived in, that we've all grown up in, the city of mass production, fossil fuel-based mass production, to the city of Facebook, the city of the algorithm. What's that going to look like? And is it actually going to happen within our lifetimes? Or is it just hype? So let's just get a sense of the mood of the room. Driverless cars. Shout out yes if you think driverless cars are going to happen. Yes. Okay. What about, now, this is pushing it. Uh, hyperloops. Hyperloops? Yes? No. I heard some no. Okay. What about vehicles that can take off and land? Basically flying cars. I mean, that's unbelievable. That's unbelievable. We got the majority of the people who answered, which was only about 1% of the room, by the way, okay, <laughs> who said yes. Um, synthetic biology. How old? This is according to Professor Sarah Harper of Oxford. The, a kid born alive, already living today. What's the longest that Sarah Harper expects them already alive today to live to? Anyone give me a number? 80? More. 100? 90? 150, Sarah Harper says. But then there's people like Aubrey Gray who say, actually, it's much bigger. That we're like the giant redwood trees in California, which just got a slightly thicker bark, a bit more tannin in there to ward off the insects, and they basically don't stop growing. He says the seven deadly things that routinely kill us, 
type 2 coronary heart disease, type 2 diabetes, coronary heart disease, certain cancers. And if we can fix them, he says that if you're under the age of 50, and I've done a scan of the room, and I can see that everyone looks under the age of 50, okay? <laughs> um, if you're under the age of 50, he says there is a, guess what? 50-50 chance, 50-50 chance, one in two, that you will achieve this thing called longevity escape velocity, LEV. What is that? Is there, by the way, any actuaries in the room or any scientists of aging? Because what he says on LEV is every day life expectancy improves. It improves round about seven hours every 24. So at the end of every 24, you're actually only 17 hours older, if you do the maths. And he says, with new exponential tech, with nanomedicine, with optogenetics, blah, 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 we're going to get it up to 18, up to 19, up to 24, and then beyond 24, which means that every day you wake up, it's like the clock on your car, the milometer has been wound back. There is more of you left. You become the gift that keeps on giving. You keep on giving to your kids, to your grandkids, to your great, great grandkids, none of whom will ever have a house, by the way, okay? <laughs> Does anyone here think they have a pension? Just checking, okay? All right, so look, this city of the future, this city of exponential tech, I mean, in a way, it's a triumph. It's magnificent. It solves all these problems, driverless cars, the air pollution, the million deaths a year from accidents. But the question is, what are the knock-on effects? What are the impacts on the fabric of society? What are the impacts on us as individuals? And I just want to play through that a little bit. Um, anyone been to Singapore recently? A few. So I got in their driverless car scheme the other day, um, and it almost immediately drove onto the wrong side of the road um, in front of a giant dumpster truck that hurtled towards us. And there was then a bit of a standoff. The guy lunged towards the wheel. He said, yep, I'm sorry, that didn't go that well. Um, but he said, listen, this technology is our do-it-yourself driverless car. Anyone can do driverless cars. This is a DIY driverless car with off-the-shelf supermarket technology, $7,000 of equipment. You can put it on your own Skoda on your own Fiat, and it's completely infrastructure neutral, but their aim is just to get it out as fast as possible. And then what really got interesting was when I was talking to the Ministry of Transport, who are writing the rule book for the city, and they said it's part of a bigger vision for the city. Step one is driverless cars. Step two is to fully automate the economy. Mass automation of all jobs. Step three is then universal basic incomes. Basically where you get paid to sit and watch Netflix. Bodyguard, Orange is the New Black, etc., etc. You get paid to do that for a very long time. Step four is then to close the city gates to migrants. Because they said it is too socially complex. And as you know, you've already got northern Jakarta going down under climate stresses with water level rises. Step four is to close the city gates. And what I want to look at is what does that do? If that's an economic model, and you see it in the picture that was up there before, that the new city, the technopolis, it is behind a fence. It's located behind a fence. If that's the ripple onto the fabric of society, what does it start to do to the businesses, the cities, the societies that we've grown up in? And here's where I'd like to play out some stuff that to me matters. Um, one of it is I think all of us have been brought up with some assumptions about the way an economy works, the way businesses work. And one of those assumptions is mass is good. The big is what really works. That efficiency is the god we bow down to. That we got these high fixed cost centralized business models, often with long control spans. And as long as you get the numbers up, you hit your break even and you're in profit. It's the economics of mass that has dominated. But if we start to see these exponential technologies coming through, 
then all sorts of sectors that we've come to depend on for business as usual start to look a little bit vulnerable. So when you took your plane here from Dublin to Geneva, what was the total profit of the flight? Anyone give me a guess? The profit for that flight? Does anyone give me 20,000 euros? And give me 10,000? It's about 550, 600 pounds profit for that flight. That's three of us deciding not to do it, for it not to start being economic. You take airports again. If you have driverless cars, that's 20% of their revenue that goes from parking, because airports basically make money from parking and selling Toblerone. That's the model. If you take the cargo, 41% of the cargo, it goes from 3D printing. There's all these direct impacts, but the real issue is the indirect impacts. Because if what we have is artificial intelligence taking our jobs, and this is one model of how it could work, if what we have is the triumph of capital over labor, where the job of new technology is to displace human intelligence, to say human intelligence doesn't matter, because actually the machine can do it better, cheaper, faster. If we have that deployment, where 47% of white collar jobs in the UK and US, this is Frey and Osborne's study, and globally, if you look at the Frey studies, there's not a country in the world in the Frey analysis that has less than 55% total job loss to automation. India, for example, where there's no, there's a lot of participants today, 69% according to the World Bank's study as well. If we go that route, then what really worries me is a lot of the numbers start not to add up anymore. It's not just the pension schemes, where the combination of the baby boomers and the adult social care costs just don't add up because people don't have the money to pay for those systems with the aging increases kicking in. It's the banks, where the top 5% of a bank, the richest 5%, generate 150% of the profits. And if that richest 5% lose their jobs, then the whole banking system becomes uneconomic. It's sector after sector, including the utilities, including, of course, the universities, that have all got these fixed costs that depend on the numbers. They start to become more vulnerable. And of course, there's some winners. The strongest survive, they consolidate. But a lot of innovative and wonderful smaller scale institutions look like they're in trouble. But the real issue then is, what does this do to the politics? Um, because the next great fear is that this stuff doesn't happen on its own. If you do have a lot of people who suddenly are losing their jobs, and if they're getting older, and if government doesn't have the incomes from the income tax, from the corporate tax, from the business rates to start meeting these social costs, then what you see is councils going down. You see schools starting to cut corners. You see hospitals starting to cut corners. You see university budgets getting pulled. You see tuition fees hiking up. You see a set of economic pressures headed in the wrong directions. And the risk that what you also get the first glimmers of is this tango this toxic tango, this death waltz between automation and protectionism, where as people lose their jobs, as the unemployment starts to go up, as the zero-hours contracts start to go up, as the wages go down, as the pressures on quality of life go up, what you see is more demand for populist policies to put in place protectionist measures that reduce trade, that reduce openness, that reduce the influx of new innovators, that reduce growth, that create more job losses. That for me is the scenario that takes us into the place where we don't want to go. And if you layer onto that some of the challenges that exist out there, the World Bank's projection of 4.9 billion people in Asian and African megacities by 2035. And what are those cities going to be like? A lot of them are low-lying. A lot of them are on bodies of water. A lot of them are subject to sudden or gradual climate stresses. Those are the places where the World Bank projects 140 million refugees being forced to flee in distressed migration by 2040. So if we think we got a problem with Brexit, if we think we got a problem with the closure of open political systems at the moment, there's a prospect that if we turn our back 
on that broken countryside. If we decide to go the Singapore route and look inward and say, actually, we're going to shut those gates. We're just going to shut them. And we're going to use blockchain and facial recognition technologies to do some pretty hardcore, some pretty hardcore security. If we go that route, I think there is a danger that there is a very large problem that is out there. For me, this is not about black swans. This is about the black elephants. The black elephants that we as an economy and we as societies have decided, sometimes quite heroically, that we can't see, that we can't see in the room. And they're the black elephants of environmental instability and the black elephant of social instability, of rising, of mounting inequality. And those black elephants are going to come and they're going to trample. They're going to trample on some stuff. I was told to do a really uplifting keynote. <laughs> so where does the wonderful life bit come in? I want to bring in a great American political philosopher who's underappreciated by the academic studies so far, which is Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> and Marilyn said this great thing, which is sometimes good things fall apart so that better things can take their place. And I think we're at, for the economists in the room, this is a bit of an economics joke. I know you may say that's a paradox. We're not at a Minsky moment. We're at a Marilyn moment, where there is the possibility of something better falling into place. And what I'd love to do is tell you, I don't know, a, a couple of stories until I, get, until I see you looking really bored. Okay, when I see you really looking bored, I'll stop, I'll shorten the, okay, but stories, look. Can we go back to the, the, the picture for a sec? Because one relates to a university um, and some, a group out of Said at, um, at Oxford, their great MBA program. By the way, the Exeter crew are doing a fantastic job and the Exeter One Planet MBA is another brilliant, brilliant example. Um, but um, so this group that you can see, sort of their fingers laced into the fence. Well, some of them actually are from uh, Nairobi's hub of innovators, of innovators who are out there trying to look at some of these problems and see how they can use tech and some simple stuff to solve them. And one of the examples, there's loads of them around you know, cow fertility, microrrogation, you name it. But just one I want to pull out, which is inspired by um, some Said and London Business School students. And these guys, called MCOPA, um, they just took a look at some of those 4.9 billion people who are the central defining challenge of the 21st century um, and said, OK, what could be done? And they thought, OK, let's start with the most basic thing, which is power. Because if you don't have electricity, if you don't have access to power, you're kind of in trouble. You're kind of in trouble. And they thought, OK, the, the, the D-Light, the solar light, is great, but it's too expensive. It's a couple of hundred bucks to get a decent one that really gives you some oomph. So no one who actually doesn't have power can afford it. But what they then did was say, maybe we can do a simple Internet of Things play, where you put a SIM card into it, which then means you can turn it on and off remotely, which means that no one can steal it, or there's no point, because they just get turned off, which then means that you can lease it to people, rent it for 40 or 50 cents a day, which is way less than they'd be spending on firewood or kerosene, all those things that's impacting their health. And then with that, a few interesting things happened. Exam pass rates went up from 58 to 83%. With the light, they were able to study more at night. They were able to, with the SIM card, to get a banking system. They were able to start saving up the money going into productive things like insurance for crops and fertilizers that then get remote, immediate payments if there was drought or flooding for the crops. With it, they were also then able to do a microloan for the Kickstart hand pump that got them access to triple the amount of crops because they could tap into the underground water table that's there for 98% of unirrigated sub-Saharan land. With just this very simple set of technologies, they managed to... Um, get incomes up from an average in one study, $180 a head per year to $1,800. And they started to migrate up the chain into refrigeration, into agricultural equipment, from being bottom of the pyramid, poorest to the poor, to being small businesses, actually, who were starting to work. In other words, reversing the causes of 
the underlying problems. And that was a bunch of university kids from an international program where what they got slammed into with the Ember Threats program, where they really focused on the global threats of what out there, they just got slammed into, here is a need. And then a group of innovators, with a bit of mentoring, here's what you could do about it. Partnered up with Safaricom, Vodafone, a million pound uh, grant from the government to help scale it up, and it's now going gangbusters. Let me give you another little example from a school in Paraguay that I visited a while back. And this is um, a high school, and it just stayed with me because this is my dream for where my daughter goes when she's 16. Um, and this is set up by a brilliant guy called uh, Martin Burt, who used to be the mayor of Asuncion just after the dictators in Paraguay. Um, and um, he just created this school where the, the poorest of the poor in, in the Chaco region of Paraguay basically earn their own school fees. No one's got the money for school fees. The state doesn't have the capacity to be laying on the public sector education. So he teaches them basically to grow their school fees. And I went down there um, to do some, do some research right when Britain was having its London riots, when there were, you know, British students rampaging through aisle 12 of, 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 of Tesco's. Um, and I was with these kids who were there with their machetes cutting down sugarcane to grow their own organic sugar, to make their own dulce de leche. Has anyone had dulce de leche, by the way? Unbelievable stuff, irresistible. And I was with Marta, this girl whose father had just been arrested for assaulting her mother about a month before this 15-year-old 15 15 wonderful girl, and she took me out into the cowboy town, and she was just wafting the dulce de leche under the noses of drivers flagging down their cars to get them to stop and selling it every time to them. It was just the sense of empowerment that she had. Let me give you one last story of a school um, that's inspired me, which is a crazy reverse school that has started up close to where I live, um, in Brent, in London. If anyone's from London, you know that Brent is not celebrated as the most incredibly beautiful part of London. But it's a really cool, it's a really cool area with a lot of stuff mixing up. And in one of the toughest um, areas, just off the North Circular Road, I want to tell you a story about a Somali refugee kid. So this kid, he's 15 now. He's called Sammy. And he's at school leaves the housing estate, go to school, and his mother starts to clear up his room. And as she's clearing up the room, she hears a quack, a quacking noise. And believe me, if you, go, if you know the North Circular, you know there's not a lot of biodiversity, there's not a lot of ecosystem. Nothing is expected to go quack. Um, and you know, why is there this noise? And she rummages around under the bed, and she pulls out what she realizes is the old family aquarium, which she'd thrown away six weeks ago. She puts the aquarium on Sammy's bed, and inside the aquarium, she finds Sammy's sister's hairdryer, which she'd been complaining had disappeared, um, and a thermostat. And Sammy has rigged up, it later turns out, um, from a packet which he managed to save up to buy at our supermarket Waitrose. He's rigged up an incubator in which he's hatching quail eggs. Why this Somali refugee with a, with a, with a, with a single mother is, had this idea, we don't know. Um, and I then went and visited him um, to find out more about this story. And it turns out his mother first of all said, Sammy, you've lost your mind. Then he said, actually, they're delicious. And right now, where do we get our food from? We get our food from the food bank. And you know, I'm really grateful to them, but frankly, the food's not that good. These are going to be way more tasty, much better protein. And she says, OK. And they go to the food bank. The food bank, Sufra, is having a board meeting, with people sitting there in suits and ties. Sammy comes, takes the quail out of his pocket, puts it on the table, and says, I can make you these. And I can make you chickens too, if you're really bored. OK, if you're really, if you're really bored. And they then do a crowd funder for Sammy. He raises 2,000 pounds for them. They've now got a chicken farm about the size of this platform with quails, with chickens, with pheasants also growing there. They produce 
a huge load of food, which they then sell to the local community. Um, he then got them to build a teepee, a giant tent, which is now just like your campfires out there. This little circle where different people come together. Corporations now send their employees on team building days to come and volunteer at the Sufra food bank. And they come up to Sammy and he says, listen, it's really sad. They don't know what to do with their lives, but at least I'm trying to help them. I'm, um, <laughs> what have we got? We got him, this 15-year-old Somali kid who's actually showing a different way of doing stuff, a different way of doing stuff to a whole load of London businesses who are based, who've grown up with a completely different model of doing stuff. I think we are at this point of inflection between an economic model that was great, that lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty, mass production, but which is potentially poised to turn them back in the other direction, into one that does not yet exist, but which could be, could be remarkably better. And what is that transition all about? I think it's about making a change in the role of education. From education being metric focused, from equipping kids to tick the boxes on the exam scores that'll help them get potentially these jobs that potentially might exist, but which certainly aren't going to fill them with a life full of meaning, and which will end them coming up as volunteers to a food bank run by a Somali refugee who does actually understand what life is about. We're at a point of inflection from that model, which is about to start to unravel to one which does not yet fully exist, where in fact there is a radically different vision of what matters. What is that vision about? It's about seeing that those black elephants are real, that the climate instabilities, that the social instabilities are real, that externalities are the endangered species, that the externalities are about to come home to roost. It's about transitioning to a model which is, I think, one that's best summed up by E.F. Schumacher when he talks about economics as if the people and planet actually mattered. I think technology is about to hit us, and it either is going to make things radically better or radically worse. It could be addressed just like the Singaporean driverless car to close us off from the other. Or it could be addressed just like M. Copper, just like even Sammy, to say, listen, here are these problems. This is what's out there. This is what we can do across water, across sanitation, across housing, across education, you name it, across issue after issue. We've now got this extraordinary arsenal which we can deploy to do amazing things. Is tech the answer? Technology is not the answer. Technology is, of course, just the amplifier of intent. What is the crucial, crucial quality, the substance that I think is going to determine whether it's the wonderful life or whether it's the apocalypse? It's just that intent. And what is this room? What are all the extraordinary institutions that you all play these roles in do? Well, you are the laboratory of that intent. You are this extraordinary space where you can slam these students together, immerse them with each other and with the problems that are out there with the world and help convert that human capital not into something which is displaced and made idle by the machine, but into some extraordinary thing which is this fuel to go and address those problems. This sector, for me, is at the heart of that pivot, that potential pivot from Marilyn's worst thing to the thing that is much, much better. And you have something much, much better than this speech coming up, which is the weekend.
but I would meet just like really to thank you for having me here. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.